I, as I'm sure will tell you, um, is very happy um, that Minnesota is once again number one uh, nationwide in um, voter turnout. There are a few rivalries more pitched than between Minnesota, Wisconsin, and a couple other places for number one um, in turnout. Uh, and, but I think it's fair to say that social media played a role uh, in that. So we'll start um, with Steve to, to give us a few remarks, uh, and then we'll get on with the rest of our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today to this second annual event on the state of voting and elections in Minnesota. Uh, this is really an opportunity from my standpoint to take a look at where we've been, where we are, and where we're going in terms of democracy and elections in the state of Minnesota. I want to thank the Humphrey School. Uh, thanks to Larry Jacobs, who couldn't be here today, to Doug Chapin, our moderator, and in particular, thanks to Facebook for their participation in this event. We really appreciate it. This year's theme, obviously, is the impact of social media in modern elections. And we witnessed that firsthand last year, and we're going to get into that a lot, I promise you. It was an amazing year. But before I take up that issue in my remarks, I just want to provide a little bit of context for the role of social media, not just in 2016, but going forward. I'd like to talk a little bit about 2016 itself, talk about some core election challenges that we have, and then look to the future, which very obviously includes a future with social media as part of our elections landscape. So 2016, you know, I like to say as Secretary of State that I'm in the democracy <coughs> business. And what a time to be in the democracy business. Am I right? I mean, we just went through a period that is really amazing in American history. We had a presidential election like no other. Part of that reason, in my judgment, was that we had two major party presidential candidates who, now let me put this diplomatically, let's just say they inspired strong feelings. How's that? Does that capture it? They inspired strong feelings. Uh, and that's definitely the case. Uh, so there was a real fierce, sustained intensity about the last election that I think is unmatched in recent history. I think most of us would agree about that. And in the midst of all that, we in Minnesota set a goal, and our office set a goal. And the goal was to return Minnesota to number one in voter turnout. Uh, when I gave this address last year, different location, I outlined the plan by which my office would try to shape that outcome of getting back to number one. And when the election was over, wouldn't you know it, when the dust settled, we got there. Minnesota, back on top, number one in the country in voter turnout. So, so that was great. We had started slipping just a little bit in recent years, and we got back to number one, and we're very happy about that. So how did we get there? I get asked that question a lot. How do we get back to number one? Uh, part of it, I think, pretty obviously, from my standpoint, is some of the laws that we have on the books. We're very blessed. We're very fortunate in Minnesota. We have election day registration, right? We're still one of only about 15 or 16 states that has that. We have online voter registration. We were one of the very first states. Now over 30 states have online voter registration. And we have no excuses absentee voting, which was a huge change. I was proud to author that change during my last uh, term in the legislature. And it means you don't have to be absent anymore to vote absentee. You can vote absentee for any reason you want. It's nobody's business what the reason is. And Minnesotans flock to it. How much? This much. Almost 23% of voters in the last election in Minnesota voted before Election Day. Almost 23%. And just to give you some context for that number, in a normal election year, before we had this in the law, the normal absentee ballot percentage was 8, 9, 10, maybe 11% in a stretch year. So more than double, virtually overnight, because of this reform that Minnesotans obviously embrace and really, really love. Uh, another thing that we did in our office was we really tried to focus where we needed to focus. That is on communities or portions of the state uh, where uh, there was room for improvement in voter turnout. So for example, we focused on military families with renewed outreach, with the use for the first time in Minnesota history of a veteran ID card as a tool for registration. That had never happened before. That affects over 100,000 Minnesota families, and we instituted that in our office. We also focused on new Americans, immigrants to this country. We more than doubled the number of languages that we serve, both on the website and in hard copy materials, from five foreign languages to 11 foreign languages, as a welcome mat to those who are eligible to vote, who are citizens, but for whom English is not their native language. We focused on youth. We focused on young people with two very special and brand new successful initiatives. And the idea here was to get good habits started early. You know, all the studies show that if you can get young people thinking about themselves as voters, even before they're voters, they're far, far more likely than to vote 
in that first election in which they're eligible, when they're 18 or 19 or 20 or 21, and we did that. And we thought, let's start in the high schools, even before most uh, uh, students are eligible to vote. And so we instituted something that had never been done in Minnesota history, as far as we're aware, which is the first ever statewide mock election for high school students. We kept it real simple, we kept it only to high school students, and we kept it only to the one contest, President of the United States, not county commissioner, not state senate, just the presidency. And when we first started out, since this has never been done, we thought, well, what's a suitable goal? Let's shoot for 100 schools. No one's done this before, we're asking them to take somewhat of a risk. Let's shoot for 100, it's a nice round number. We didn't get 100, we got 261 high schools for a total enrollment of 96,000 students. Uh, so it, was, it had a huge ripple effect, we got great feedback, and a lot of students who really for the first time were immersed in this process in a real kind of tangible way. But we didn't stop at high schools, we also went to colleges and universities. And there we instituted also a new program, highly successful, which we called Ballot Bowl. What Ballot Bowl pretty much was, was a competition among college campuses to register students to vote. We had 68 schools participating in some form or fashion uh, in Ballot Bowl. Two year, four year, public, private, it didn't matter. And it really galvanized students on campuses, so much so that on some campuses, the local chapter of the Democrats and the Republicans cooperated together, if you can believe that, in order to boost their school's numbers and get good bona fide registrants for purposes of this competition. So that was a big success as well. So we're proud of that result. We're proud at getting back to number one. Uh, and we're proud of how we got there, but I think we all need to acknowledge, certainly in our office, that we still have challenges in our election system. This is a national thing, but certainly in Minnesota as well. Um, and before I talk about what the challenges are, I want to mention what I regard as one of the major distractions. Uh, some of you may remember that after the election, the president-elect uh, claimed repeatedly that three to five million people, three to five million in this country, voted illegally. They broke the law. They were felons. Um, I have to say, um, let's say for a minute that you believe that he exaggerates from time to time. Um, that it's not five million, that it's really closer to three million. Minnesota's pro rata share of three million is over 50 thousand voters. So what the president-elect then was saying and has repeated is that on average more than 50,000 people in Minnesota are felons, they belong in prison, they, they violated the law and they voted unlawfully. Folks, that has never happened, it's not happening now, it will never happen, that number is pure fantasy and it's an irresponsible claim. Nonetheless, uh, a short time later the president instituted what he called the Presidential Advisory Commission on election integrity. You may have seen that earlier this week they had their second meeting. It's a commission that is co-chaired by Vice President Pence and by the Kansas Secretary of State, uh, Chris Kobach. Um, a few weeks after that, we in our office got a request, an invitation you might say, to provide data to this commission. I got this, every other Secretary of State and Chief Elections Administrator got this as well. And it was an invitation to hand over, in our case, nearly four million complete voter files and records on every registered voter in Minnesota. This is not just name or address or whether you voted in a particular year. They wanted everything that the law in Minnesota would permit our office, permit our office to hand over. That includes social security information. That includes driver's license information. That includes uh, residential history, military history, a whole host of very private, sensitive, personal information. Now this wasn't a court order, it was not a subpoena, it was an invitation. And I am proud to tell you that I RSVP'd no to that invitation. Um, and, and I did that for several reasons, the first of which is privacy. I don't think any one of us in this room that is registered to vote, nor anyone we know who is registered to vote, ever thought in their wildest dreams that their personal private information would be handed over to some ad hoc federal commission that's apparently creating some sort of patched together database of all US voters. I don't think people thought that was part of the deal. And so I wasn't gonna hand over nearly four million people's records. But more than just that, I think that the leadership and the membership of this uh, commission is slanted. It's not truly bipartisan. The two co-chairs, uh, Mike Pence and Secretary Kobach of Kansas, these are articulate spokespeople for their point of view. Uh, they're smart people, but they have a point of view, a very clear, 
often stated point of view, echoing the president's claim that three to five million people, in fact, either did or may have voted illegally in this country. So these are not objective people leading an objective inquiry, and that gave me great pause as well. Um, I also think, relatedly, that this commission already seems to be headed towards predetermined outcomes, the outcome that really started it all, which is a conclusion about the scope of any wrongdoing or fraud in the last election. And then there are other issues. Uh, they seem poised to use the data that they get. They're not getting it from us. But the data that they do get, they seem poised to use it in ways that both don't make sense and that could really be dangerous. Uh, running it through databases that we know produce a lot of false positives, which is a fancy way of saying fingering the wrong people for illegal conduct when they did nothing wrong. And I wasn't going to subject the people of Minnesota, uh, any registered voter, to that kind of shoddy process. But I think the final issue bears on uh, what we're going to be talking about today, at least somewhat. I do think that the work of this commission, um, in concept and in practice so far, is a distraction. And it's a distraction from what I believe is the main challenge that we face as elections administrators and that all of us face just as citizens. And the main challenge, I think, uh, when it comes to the uh, integrity of our election is cybersecurity threats. I think that is it. I think that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several years, and we should. So that's the real issue. The cybersecurity challenges are real. The headlines that we all saw and felt and experienced last year and up to this date, I should say, are real. And those threats potentially are real. So once in a while, you should just know this. I get asked, whether it's by friends and family at Thanksgiving dinner or someone I see on the street who knows me, just acquaintances. They'll ask me, hey, you know, you've been in the job now two, two and a half years. What's your biggest surprise about being Secretary of State? And my answer is always the same. My biggest surprise about this job so far is the extent to which my time and the time of senior staff in my office is spent on cybersecurity. It didn't come up in a candidate debate. It wasn't on a single interest group questionnaire. It wasn't on anyone's television or radio ads for this office. And yet, front and center, that is a major responsibility of this office, as I've found out. And I think that's a recent phenomenon. I don't think it was even that true four years or eight years or 12 years ago, but it is now. And I tell you that just to give you a sense of the dimension of what I see as the challenge before us. Now, the good news is that the fundamental architecture of our, Minnesota, of our system in Minnesota, the design of our election system, is fundamentally sound and has built into it a number of protections against intrusions. For example, let's go back to basics. Minnesota is still old school, right? We still vote with pen and paper. You still just go to a place. It's basically a glorified desk, right? And you fill in an oval with a pen. It's hard to hack paper. So we're in good shape there, and that's not the case everywhere. There are a dozen or a dozen and a half states in this country where either completely or partially they use touchscreen machines with no receipt or paper trail of any kind. In Minnesota, there is a bipartisan, long-standing, rock-solid consensus in favor of a paper trail now and always. So you can touch it and feel it and see it and verify it. So that's good news. And it is true that you do feed that ballot into an electronic device, usually a ballot counter in the polling place. But uh, under state law in Minnesota, that device cannot, shall not, must not at any time be connected to the internet. Moreover, when we're tallying the votes, the method by which local governments typically send us their results on election night, that is through an encrypted system. And even then, there are real human beings that talk to other real human beings to verify the actual outcome and the actual numbers. So I'm a little less concerned about intrusions in the polling place, though they are possible. I'm here to tell you they are absolutely possible. But I'm a little less concerned about that than I am about possible vulnerabilities when it comes to something like, say, the statewide voter registration system, the SVRS, which is something that our office built and that we run and that we maintain. Um, there, last election, the uh, similar system in two other states, uh, Arizona and Illinois, was hacked. And in one case, there was a successful breach and intrusion uh, where people were going into the voter records and had full access. Uh, probably foreign sourced. Uh, that's what intelligence sources believed. Uh, and that is a real wake-up call to all of us. Now, we did not have that experience, fortunately, in Minnesota. And truth be told, for the last two and a half years, we've been really trying to do something about this problem. What are those things? Well, we formed the first ever cybersecurity team in our office to tackle exactly this problem, not as some sort of add-on. Uh, number two, we hired an outside consultant to be an extra set of ears and eyes and hands to poke and prod and assess our vulnerabilities. And fortunately, uh, things came out well and we did not have an intrusion. Uh, we also are working increasingly, sometimes daily, 
with the Department of Homeland Security in Washington, D.C., and I'll tell you that is made um, even more possible uh, by something that happened uh, last January, which is that in the wake of the last election, the Department of Homeland Security decided to confer upon the election systems in this country what's called the critical infrastructure designation. Sounds technical, I know, but it's really meaningful. Critical infrastructure isn't just a tagline, it's an official status that is conferred upon key parts of our national life. The power grids, the banks, military installations. It's meant to do two things. Number one, it's a warning to foreign actors that we're putting certain parts of our national life up high on a pedestal and you attack them or mess with them at your own risk. Um, that hadn't been the case in 2016, it is the case now, and that's been bipartisan. The Obama administration, on its way out the door, implemented it. The Trump administration has decided, at least tentatively, to keep it. Um, and so that's a good thing, but it also affords us, in our office, uh, potential access to intelligence briefings, threat assessments, even um, help with best practices from the Department of Homeland Security. So we're doing a whole lot more, and we'll be doing a whole lot more on that front as well. So that's a good thing, uh, but we can't lose sight that Fighting cyber intrusion does take time, it takes effort, it takes energy, and another thing, it takes money. It takes resources. It's not about doing more with less. It's about doing more, period, uh, and sometimes that means more with more. It's going to have to mean that in the future. So we've been trying to do something about that as well. On the elections equipment front, that's where potential vulnerabilities at the polling place could uh, show up, possibly. Uh, Minnesota has old stuff. We have old elections equipment, and most of the other states do too. That has to do with a law that was passed by Congress in 2002 that funded this stuff, but that money has gone away. And the stuff that we have is old, getting older, start, starting, starting to show its wear and tear, and if we don't properly get out ahead of this and manage this, we're, we're asking for some trouble. So starting in 2015, our office convened a working group of legislators in Minnesota from both chambers and both parties, uh, elections administrators from all levels of government to try to get some support, try to get some help, try to get a down payment from the state government to the local governments who own the stuff. In our office, we don't own one piece of elections equipment, not one, because we don't operate a, pol operate a polling place, but they do at the local government level, and they need help. They're in a tough spot. And so this last legislative session, we got $7 million from the state, for the purchase of elections equipment for local government, that's going to make a good size dent and down payment into the whole problem. And at the federal level, Senator Klobuchar this week has an amendment to a major bill uh, now working its way through Congress that would provide for the first time ever cybersecurity grants to the states, to Secretary of State offices, to shore up things like the voter registration database, to help local governments buy new equipment, to implement best cybersecurity practices. And so we're keeping our fingers crossed that if not now, then sometime soon, we'll get that federal help as well. So we know there are challenges, of course. We're proud about what we did in 2016 as a state, despite those challenges. Uh, and looking ahead to 2018, we have to ask ourselves, how can we engage voters in new ways? Manage those problems and challenges, but really engage voters again. And in a non-presidential year, of course, we have extra work to do. There isn't that sizzle of a presidential contest to get every voter all the time really engaged. We'll have an open seat governor's race in this state. That'll be key, of course. Uh, but it'll be incumbent upon a lot of people to really get people energized and interested in the next election. Now, partly, I think, we have to alter our message when it comes to voting. Away from pure idealism, pure altruism, to talk a little bit about self-interest. You know, typically the appeals have been couched in something like this. You should vote because it's the right thing to do. You should vote because you're part of a community. You should vote because people fought and bled and sometimes died for the right to vote. And all those are true and we should never ever ditch any of those as a reason and rationale to vote, but I think we should add to them. And particularly for young people, we should add to them uh, the idea that you should also vote because it's in your interest to vote. It's in your own self-interest to vote. It's not just about idealism as well. Uh, and then there's even little turns of a phrase that can make a difference. You know, there was a study last year I found fascinating. There was a study last year that showed that particularly as to young people, if you talk about voting as an appeal for someone to be something rather than do something. Don't just say go vote, but if you say be a voter, that can, honest to God, move the needle among certain populations, particularly young people. Be a voter, be something, not do something. So I told that story to a friend of mine and he said, this is great, I love it. I've got a teenage daughter at home. From now on, I'm gonna tell her, be a laundry folder. Um, I, no word yet on whether that worked, but you get the, the general idea. So altering the message will be key as well. And then, of course, 
is the subject of today, which is social media. Ever present in so many areas of life, and it was probably always for the last decade or so a part of elections life, but really came into focus this last election and will uh, going on into the future. Uh, I mentioned online voter registration, a great tool. We've had it in Minnesota since 2013. Let me tell you, social media in general and Facebook in particular have transformed a great and useful tool into one that is potentially transformational. And I don't use those words lightly. Let me give you the numbers. Going into 2016, just think about this for a second. Going into 2016, the one day record in Minnesota for registering to vote, people who attempted to use our website, our online voter registration website in a single day was 6,400. 6,400, that's pretty good for one day. You multiply that by 365 days, that's a lot of people. But in one day, 6,400, that was the record going into calendar year 2016. Then, through co some collaborative efforts of our office and a lot of other groups around the state, there was a day when we got it up to about 24,000 in a single day as we approached the fall election. We were very proud of ourselves, right? 24,000, that's great. It's a lot of eyeballs, it's a lot of people getting engaged and seeking to register on our website. Until Facebook came along. Facebook sent out what we believe is a single notification to its users across the country, and it was segmented by state, obviously, telling them how and where to register to vote. In one day in October last year, we had nearly 70,000 people go to our website to register to vote. I would love to say that's because of our office. It was because of Facebook. Facebook pushed these messages out, and it had a tremendous, I think, in the future, potentially transformative power. 70,000, 6,400 going into the calendar year to almost 70,000 in a single day because of Facebook. Posts on Facebook telling people what the information is and where to go. So that is truly ama amazing. Social media, of course, has its challenges. Uh, Facebook, of course, you've read the headlines, has to grapple with people uh, using its platform. And really, this applies to any social media platform. Uh, to spread false information, and you've seen some of those headlines. But, and I'm sure our next speaker will undoubtedly address those issues, at least generally, and hopefully she'll give us a glimpse into the deep thinking that I know Facebook has done about its role in civic engagement, news delivery, and voter empowerment. I think our system is better and more exciting because of social media in general, and Facebook in particular. So it's my pleasure right now then to introduce uh, really our keynote speaker today from Facebook, Sharon Yang. Uh, Sharon Yang is the government and politics manager at Facebook, where she specializes in helping government, nonprofit, and other civic groups optimize their presence on Facebook. Before joining Facebook, Sharon worked uh, with the World's Fair in Milan. Maybe she knows, maybe she doesn't, that Minnesota is vying for the 2023 uh, Expo. Uh, she also worked with the Aspen Institute, uh, two presidential campaigns, and other political, civic, and communication-focused entities, doing her part to make their work more impactful. In her career, she has worked with people as diverse as and as world famous as fashion designers and crown princes. She is a first generation Chinese American, an accomplished photographer, a recovering competitive figure skater, and she's with us here today. Please welcome from Facebook, Sharon Yang. Hi. I'm really happy to be here and join all, you, all of you. Thank you, Secretary, for that very generous introduction. Uh, my name is Sharon Yang, and I work for a small company called Facebook that you might have heard of. So um, I know that, um, how many of you are on Facebook? OK, so we have a place to start. You, we have some contacts here. Great. So let me just start by sharing our mission. So recently, we updated our mission statement to focusing on giving people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And this is something that we updated quite recently. Uh, and Mark, my CEO, wrote a letter uh, that he published in February on Facebook uh, in which he um, basically laid out the vision for Facebook. And one of those pillars was to help create more civically engaged communities. And as the Secretary mentioned, my role at Facebook is to educate politicians and our elected officials on how they can use our platform because our platform is where they can go and connect with their, uh, the people that they represent and where the Facebook community can find and follow the, their own elected representatives. So just taking a step back, um, as you are all very well aware, 
the climate of communications has changed. Um, so not that long ago, TV and print was all that was needed, but now we know that social media plays a very big role in this now. Um, and it's an increasingly important um, place to connect and in effective communications. So I just wanted to show you briefly um, an overview of our, the numbers on our community. Um, we've got, we crossed a major milestone with two billion community members on Facebook this year. And again, a growing number is Instagram, 700 million people on Instagram. And so you can see that Facebook, bottom line is Facebook is a great place to reach people and where a lot of people are already spending their time. Uh, I think in 2016, Pew did a poll and found that 44% of Americans actually go to Facebook for their news. And specifically in the US, I wanted to share, a, a, again, some of our numbers. You can see 215 million people are using Facebook every month, uh, and 164 million of, the, of those 215 come back every single day. So how many people use Facebook every single day? Log in. Okay. So, um, so that's 77%. And the biggest number, what most interesting, especially when I, when I speak to elected officials or campaigns, is how many people are using Facebook on their mobile device every single day. So we always say that that's very important when they're trying to communicate with their constituents. And it will shape how we also launch products which I will talk about in, in a couple more slides. Uh, so about one every five minutes on desktop and mobile is spent on Facebook. And uh, people spend an average of 50 minutes on Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger every day. And people check Facebook on average 14 times a day. And since I work at Facebook, that is, I skew very much higher than that. But on average, it's about 14 times. And so during the 2016 presidential election, we started tracking things. And this number started when Ted Cruz announced his candidacy in 2015. Um, and this, this counted through the election. That 355 million unique people on Facebook created 12 billion interactions related to the election. So that is comments, likes, posts, shares. Um, and this was globally the most talked about subject in 2015 and 2016. So Facebook is where, and still, and will and likely beyond, be where political conversations are happening. So let's talk a little bit about civic engagement. And again, this is the letter, this is the community letter that Mark published in February. And one place that I, this, it will stop and it'll show you. But I wanted to highlight one pillar, is that he wanted to focus on how to create a more civically engaged community. If you haven't read this, it was published in February. I highly recommend it. It's on his Facebook page. But it, again, it lays out the vision for Facebook. So our approach with civic engagement is that we want to help people have a voice in government every single day at every single level. At every single level. And so while for years we have, you know, <laughs> reminded people on election day that it's election day and go out and vote. Um, we really want to start focusing on making sure that, that, you know, submitting a ballot and voting was just the beginning of that relationship and not the end of that relationship. Um, so, so we think that by, you know, helping people connect with their government, especially at the local level, we can help people build the communities that they want. So now I'm going to go into a, a few civic engagement tools, and I'll probably ask you if you've seen these just so that I can gauge the penetration of them. But we are, we're really proud this year. We've really made an investment in civic engagement. Um, we have a dedicated civic engagement team that we collaborate with in developing all these tools. And this is part of Mark's vision, and this is part of what I do at Facebook, is to really encourage people to use the civic engagement tools. So as I mentioned, since 2008, Facebook has, showing, has been showing people 18 and up by, by election day reminders to, to vote actually on election day. But again, we wanted to take this a step further in 2016. And in 2014, I believe, is when we started doing these voter reminders, election day reminders internationally. 
But again, 2016 was a very big year. We wanted to step up our game a little bit. And so we launched several new products. Uh, so making it easier for people to get information about the elections. And as the secretary mentioned, we had a voter registration prompt. And this was um, deployed to people age 18 or over by election day, reminders to register to vote, and it directed people to registration information in their particular area. Um, it, was on a, it was deployed in a rolling basis in 2016. Uh, to states that did not have same-day registration, and it ran nationally between September 23rd and September 26th. And we estimate that more than 2 million people registered to vote as a re result of seeing the registration reminders. So how many of you saw the voter registration reminders? I'm assuming a lot. Okay, good, good. Um, another really interesting and I think very exciting product that we rolled out during the presidential election was called the Issues tab. And so since we knew so many people were spending their time on Facebook, researching, finding their news, learning more about their candidates, we thought we would give the candidates a place on Facebook where they can actually, from their own voice, convey and share what their issues are. So um, this is a demonstration of of the issue, what we call the issues tab. And it's each issue, so you could go into the issues tab, and I'm sorry if the, I don't know if you can see the, the, I guess the writing is a little blurry, but you would go to a section called issues, and underneath, the candidate and their campaign would choose the different issues that they Something want to talk just about. Fundamentally it would be in 200 characters, because Americans again, everybody's reading this on mobile these days, so we wanted to keep it to 200 characters. And you could also upload 30-second videos. Um, so this was a, another way, instead of people leaving Facebook and having to comb through campaign websites, we wanted to bring that issue experience to people on, on our platform. So I'm sorry, the audio is a little bit low, but racism. so this is a, an example of an issue card where, she, where Secretary Clinton used video. And again, you can just scroll right through and find out more about each issue. Um, I actually think next to issues, voting plan uh, was another really, really fascinating project and product that we rolled out because we realized that a lot of people who are voting don't actually know what is on their ballot. You know, and this was a very, there was this, this was an issue that we wanted to address. You know what's federal, you know, you likely will know what's state, but when you get down to the local level, people started, there was, you know, people need to be educated about what was on their actual ballot. So instead of me kind of walking through, I wanted to show you a, about a minute and a half, a quick clip on how preview your ballot actually worked. Um, so we began rolling this out, the voting plan feature, to people, again, 18 and over on our platform on October 28th in 2016. And more than 9 million people previewed their election day ballots using the voting plan. And essentially, the voting plan helped people, you know, one, research uh, about their candidates, compare issues, um, and you can even pull, put in your address so that you could actually get your local ballot as well. And all the, you know, all the candidates were always in random order. On the voting plan, you could, you could choose to share who you're voting for or who you're favorited. You could take a look at endorsements, which, this, um, which is being previewed right now. You could ask for advice. You could share, you could actually favorite your, your um, preferred candidates or your ballot measures and print out the ballot. But you could also keep it private as well. You didn't have to share this information. This was just if you wanted to. So again, all the candidates were random. And you could choose one, share it if you wanted to. And this went all the way down, again, to the local level. So I'll let this play for a little bit more. I know the text is a little bit hard, but I really wanted you to kind of, I, again, if you had not seen this unit, this voting plan, I wanted you to get a sense of what we were trying to do, is really trying to make a more informed voter during the last cycle. This really needs some music, doesn't it? I know, I'm sorry. I'm not a great singer, so I won't sing in the background. But it goes down to the Senate, and it kind of goes through the same. So you can, so you can see that we're trying to introduce um, people to what is actually gonna be on the ballot, so they were prepared. And the next 
feature that a new feature that we um, after the 2016 election that we rolled out was also called meet your reps. So the day after um, the election, again, we didn't want you submitting your ballot to be the end of the conversation. We wanted it to continue. So we sent push notifications the day after the election for you to follow your member, uh, your elected, either if they're new or if they've been reelected. And this was a precursor to a, f a feature which I'll f um, talk about more called Town Hall. But it was, a, it was a push notification that looked like this, and then you had a chance to put in your address and discover who were your, who were your electeds. Okay, so what have we done since the 2016 elections? So I, as I mentioned, we've done election reminders on, on, for national elections. However, we had never done anything like local election reminders. So this year, we started rolling out local election reminders for municipalities that had about at least 10,000 people or more in them. Again, people always know when their national elections are, but we really wanted to get engagement on the local level. The, the, the other, um, next is Town Hall, which you see on the right. Have you guys all been familiar or seen Town Hall? If not, I see some nodding. So not as much. But you can find Town Hall. It's on facebook.com forward slash, forward slash Town Hall, or it's in your bookmarks. And basically, what we're trying to do is make a central place where people can find and follow their electeds. So you can, you can con and from here you can even contact your reps. But in, so basically what you would do is that you would, it, once you click on town hall, you would be prompted to put in your address. Again, this is all hashed information. We don't see it. We don't like keep it or use it for anything beyond just, you know, the civic engagement product. And then you would be, pr and then you, it would pull up, and we're still working on the civic graph on the very, very local level, but at least on the federal and state level, you would see who your representatives are. And you would, give, you would be given the chance to follow their pages. Not like, because we understand like is a different endorsement, but you would get the chance to follow a page from, you know, and it depends on which city you're in, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this area, St. Paul, Minneapolis, we have it down, mapped out pretty locally. Um, but you'll see your local and federal um, electeds. So this was really exciting for us because, again, we w and it lives on the uh, lives in Facebook, so it's there whenever you need it, whenever you want to use it. Again, we're trying to make a more civically engaged community. How do we do that? Let people know who actually represents them. Um, so we want also this to be a two-way street. You can contact your representative. You can find out who they are. But we also want electeds, politicians, campaign, well, electeds, I should say, know who you are. So we want this to be um, you know, a two-way conversation. So all those products were geared for you. But what are we doing for electeds to try to identify and communicate and have a two-way conversation with you? So we recently, uh, this year, launch a few new products as well. One is constituent badges. And so part of the, one of the biggest feedback we've heard when we talk to elected officials is that I get a lot of comments, but I really want to focus on the comments left by my constituents. So to do that, we created what we call constituent badging. So it all is related to the town hall. You can find this in the town hall hub. But once you want, what you can do, again, is you put your address in. If it's already in town hall, you'll be fine. You can turn on, scroll to the bottom, turn on constituent badging. And so when you are actually leaving a comment to a representative, to your elected official, you will get a small gray icon. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but small gray um, icon that basically indicates you are a constituent within this district, within this state. So again, it's a great way for people representing you to know okay, this is a comment that I may want to participate in or I want to pay attention to. The next is constituent insights. And this is actually available to everybody. Um, but we, I have Kamala Harris's page up there. Ba basically, you scroll over to the community tab and you can see how many of your friends are following, but also what articles are trending in your specific district. So you can see them, they can see this, but what articles, what pieces of information are trending in your specific state district, so you understand what the consi your constituent base is talking about. And lastly, t district targeting. 
you know, we made it so that if you wanted to, if you were an elected official, if you want to specifically talk to just your district, you have the chance to. So the status update, writing a status update, you can actually, before you publish, it says here on the, it says public, underneath it says your district. So you can target a message, a status update, a piece of content specifically just to your district. So, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons in the U.S. election, but obviously the team that I work on is a lot more than just U.S. Canada, which is what I focus on. We are a global team. And so I wanted to spotlight of, of some of our efforts that we've done globally as well. Uh, they're very similar to what we've done in the U.S., but of course various regions, various countries have, di you know, um, different um, priorities. So we've... I just wanted to quickly go through what we've done and spotlight specifically the UK and France, who recently both had elections. And of course, some things we're going to roll out for Germany, which they're having their elections in a couple weeks. So similar to what we've done in the US election, we've done voter registration reminders. Uh, again, I'm so, I apologize, the text is a bit hazy. Um, but we basically had the UK and we had France, and we both we did voter registration um, um, notifications for them. However, I would say political perspectives is something that was, was a development that we just did this year, and we rolled out for the French elections earlier this year. Um, we heard from a lot of people that they told us that they want to see more, way, more viewpoints, more issues, and have a way to compare them. Um, and so we took this directive, and we thought, okay, so what is the best way to do this? So in France, then in the UK, and we'll do this in Germany, we launched a new tool called Political Perspectives. And the way it works is that after you, if you see an article that is about the election, about a campaign, about an issue, if you click on it, you scroll through it, and you read it, you go back to your news feed, you'll see an, an info box that basically prompts you, it's like, do you want to know more about the election? Do you want to know more about your candidate or your party? And if you clicked on it, it would, depending if, for the UK, we had party issues because all the parties basically filled out their issues tab. There's too many MPs to keep track of, so we use parties. But for France, this, this would pivot you to candidates and their specific issues. But basically, you would click on it, and it would show you, again, in random order, and in the own candidate or party's words, uh, their stance on particular issues. And this is another reason we kept our issue card, and these are pulled from the issue cards that I, that I showed you earlier, which we also launched in several different countries. But the reason why we also kept it to 200 characters is because we wanted to, you to be able to see it in this way, a, a small, you know, a very kind of small snapshot. And a, a, one of the buttons is learn more. That would navigate you to their actual Facebook page. So again, this was our, um, our way of inserting, inserting issue diversity into our platform. So this, again, this was an example from the UK, but I wanted to show you the video that we actually launched this with in, um, in France. If I actually played it. So I don't know how many of you speak French, but basically it, 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 it reiterates what I just said. This is an article about the French elections. And if they interacted with it, if you engaged with that piece of content in any way, it would signal to us that, oh, this person might be interested in the election. You would go down, you say, okay, I want to, you know, I want to learn more. Do you want to learn more? And again, in random order and in the voice of the own candidate themselves, and we would pull these from the issue cards that they posted on their Facebook page, their perspectives. And if they didn't have an issue card filled, filled out, this would appear. Basically just saying, they, don't, they didn't submit an issue, but click here to go to their page and find out more. So we try to be as balanced as possible and give everybody a chance to participate or be in this unit that we had. And lastly, we did have something like this in the US, but also in the UK and France, which we called the election hub. And in the US, we created the election hub to kind of gather all things election related in one place. Same, we did the same in the UK. This is an example from the UK. The same thing we did here. 
Um, and it's really just one place where people can find out where to register to vote, discuss events, watch live videos. And the Election Hub would actually be launched uh, like after, during particular debates on election night. So during pivotal moments of an election, or when we thought people would adopt it the most, is when it would be rolled out. So these were all, uh, all region specific on when we would roll out the Election Hub. But again, it was a place where people could track uh, campaign activity, and this is a screenshot of when it was actually launched on election day in the UK. So with all this being said, I know that, you know, we are, Facebook has been in the news recently, um, you know, and as a platform, we are committed to, you know, integrity and authenticity on Facebook and believe that the platform is a place for genuine civic engagement, and I think you can tell that we've invested in this. Um, we constantly review suspect activity and shut down accounts that are inauthentic. With reference to last week's news, we took down uh, 470 accounts that were apparently operating out of Russia. And these accounts spent approximately $100,000 on um, Facebook ads. You know, given you know, you're probably ve all very familiar, $100,000 is a tiny fraction in campaign spending, both on Facebook and overall. But even with this small amount, we take, um, we take this very, very seriously. And you know, we've shared our findings with US authorities and are investigate that, that are you know, investigating election-related issues. And we will internally continue to investigate as well. Um, but uh, so because of the nature of this, I'm really limited to what I can comment and what I can say on about the issue. However, if you wanted to keep up and continue to follow what we can say, I wanted to leave a few resources. So newsroom.fb.com is really good. I mean, this is where we post all updates. I mean, I even look at it when we're launching products that don't affect politics and government, but politics that, or media partners and things like this. Facebook.com government politics is a good place if you ever wanted to see new products, how people are using the platform ex uh, effectively, uh, that's a good place to go. Media.fb.com is how media organizations and, uh, again, public figures are using Facebook in really great ways. We have a site, politics.fb.com, uh, that lays out what you know, a lot of our best practices. If you yourself were looking to run for office or at some point, and then, of course, my email. And uh, I'll leave that up for a minute, but uh, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so moving now into um, what I'm hoping will be uh, an interesting and informative panel discussion, let me call up um, our panel members um, I will point out just in terms of kind of logistics, um, I'm going to start out by um, having a sort of a moderated Q&A with our guests. Um, but at some point, we will get to questions from the audience. Um, I know we have our, um, our, our, our question royalty. Where are my folks with the Q&A cards in the back? Um, we'll be handing out um, Q&A cards. Um, those will be coming out shortly. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to write it down um, and um, send it up. They will all end up with me. Um, we do this in part um, so that we can cluster individual questions um, and make sure that we answer as many of your inquiries um, as possible. So if you have a question now or if something occurs to you while we are rolling through the panel discussion, um, please do write it down on the card and we'll get to as many of them as we can uh, before the end of today's event. Um, so first, I'll let me sit down in my comfortable chair um, uh, and, and call up our, um, our first um, panelist. Uh, first panelist is um, Mike Dean um, from uh, Lead MN. Uh, Lead MN is an organization which focuses on um, two-year colleges here uh, in Minnesota, and Mike um, is um, well-known uh, in the field um, as a voice for um, students and young people uh, and look forward to hearing um, what he has to say. Uh, we also have Ali Hagland um, from Students United, um, which is um, similarly the voice of um, students across um, the great, and I do mean great, state of um, Minnesota um, and uh, be looking forward to her perspective as well. Um, we also have Secretary of State 
and recovering state legislator Steve Simon, um, who will be joining us to talk about uh, the state's um, use of and use by uh, social media in the 2016 election. Uh, so first, I guess what I want to do, um, Steve got a um, uh, little time to talk. Um, uh, we'll start with you, Mike. Just talk to us a little bit about um, what Lead MN does and more particularly how you all used social media uh, in the 2016 election and what you might have learned for uh, 2018 and beyond. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today and for the University of Minnesota for hosting us and the Secretary of State. Uh, again, I work with an organization called Lead MN, where college students connecting for change. We represent the 180,000 students that attend Minnesota's two-year community and technical colleges. We're kind of a unique organization in that our role is to advocate on their behalf. And obviously, you can't effectively advocate on behalf of students if you're not engaged in the elections process. And so in 2016, we launched a robust uh, elections effort. And social media played a massive component of that. Uh, as everyone sort of said, I think everyone in the room here is on social media in some way, and so I think you can't run an effective program without doing that. Uh, but really what we've seen as the most effective way to engage folks is uh, kind of a balanced approach. Uh, it's really engaging both offline and online technology uh, as a way. We have a unique vehicle to engage students in that, the classroom. Uh, so we know where they are almost every single day. Uh, hopefully they're attending class, uh, but uh, as part of that, we're able to go to classrooms, talk to them, have one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then what we really do is use social media as a way to complement that afterwards. Once we sort of bring them in, then engage them and keep them up to speed on what's going on and ways that they can get involved. Uh, but we had a lot of success registering people online using the new online voter registration tool. Obviously, Facebook helped out significantly with engaging students, and we're thinking about new ways to engage them down the road then, too. And, and basically, the same question um, to you, Allie. And how, how, did, how did Students United use um, social media in 2016, and what did you learn, and what might it um, um, mean for how um, you proceed in uh, 2018 and beyond? Right. Uh, is this on? You're on. Okay. Uh, so we are a lot like uh, Mike, the lead of them. We're Students United, and we represent the Minnesota State Universities, which is around 70,000 students. Uh, and so we are across the state as well, and we really do take that dual approach of face-to-face -face interactions. We have students on all those campuses, and that's so important. But social media, is, it's growing, and that's where the students are, and that's where students tend to be majority of their time, even when they are in the classrooms. Um, so we really try to interact with them on social media as well. Uh, Facebook was a huge effort, but also Snapchat. We're hearing more and more that Snapchat is where students are, Instagram is where students are. So how do we get onto those platforms? Um, we use things such as uh, geo filters is something that we use um, on Snapchat to kind of get our message out. On Facebook, we try to use hashtag. We kind of did a why I vote campaign this year. Um, we had a pretty successful year. We pledged to vote over 5,000 students on our campuses, and we regis registered to vote around, I think, a little bit above 1,500,000. ,000. And we were recognized by the National Voter Registration Day. Um, we kind of made their 2016 report um, in their 10 biggest local avocations. So we, we really are trying to push social media as much as possible. Great, and, and, and Steve, let me ask you a, a slightly different version of that question. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about how um, sites like Facebook drove traffic to the secretary. Talk a little bit about how you all proactively used social media um, in 2016, and again, what it taught you about 2018 and beyond. into the hands 
of others where more people are going to have access to it. That's our main role. That's where we think we can be more productive rather than trying to build tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of followers on our Facebook page. Great. So let, let, let me ask the, the group then. So there's been a lot of focus on social media as a way to reach young people. But if you look around this room, and we all feel young at heart, but our birth certificates might say otherwise. But it's clear that people of all ages are using social media. Um, curious to how each of you have seen how different individuals or groups you interact with um, are using social media to reach not just young voters, but all voters, and, and, and what opportunities that creates. Steve, you want to go first? I'm sorry. I I So for us, it's all about audience segmentation. And so what you tend to see is that certain demographics or user groups tend to use certain different types of platforms. Uh, and so, for example, Facebook. Facebook now is used by everyone. It wasn't always the case. It was actually very specific, uh, built for college students for a large period of time. But now my mom is on Facebook, and she follows her grandchildren that way. Uh, so we tend to see now younger audiences not using Facebook as much. They're on Instagram right now. And so what we've started to do is really kind of segment segment out all the different platforms and figure out you know, which audience is there and then have custom messages uh, as part of that. This uniquely impacts us because we're not fitting a traditional college student. Uh, and so the demographics of a community college student uh, is actually average range is about 28 years old, uh, so older than the 18 to 22 year old. Uh, so with that, we have to use all the different mediums as part of that. I think what we're seeing really now is the most effective way to communicate uh, is really two things. One is Facebook Messenger. So if we want to actually engage folks, uh, they don't respond to phone calls. Uh, they don't respond to email. Uh, but they will respond to Facebook Messenger. And then obviously text messaging. And so we've seen a huge increase in participation using text messaging. Uh, and you saw this with, for example, the Bernie Sanders campaign. They use a tool called Hustle very well. And essentially, it's a peer-to-peer -peer text messaging tool where individuals can send essentially multiple text messages, but it's kind of individualized. Uh, and as part of that, we started to use that as a way to generate more interest in voting. And we've seen a huge participation rate. So we're getting 90% open rates, and we're getting about, on average, 50 to 60% participation rates in that, uh, which is huge. And if you were talking about in the email world, you're lucky if you can get 10% uh, open rates and probably a 1% to 2% participation rate. So we're seeing a, a lot of promise in that area then, too. That, that's amazing. Allie? Yeah. Um, so we deal with the university, so we do have, we see more of the traditional, the 18 to 24 year old, not that we don't have the untraditional students. So on social media, we do try to lean into our 18 to 24 year old age group, which is why I kind of slid in the Snapchat and the Instagram that we're kind of looking at. But um, that doesn't mean that older, uh, different generations aren't on social media and they're not using it actively. I read something recently where uh, baby boomers are more likely than millennials to click into um, articles and things from Facebook or from different like Twitter. Uh, so I don't think that social media negates older generations from being target audiences for social media campaigns at all. Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious. At, at my house, I have I have three grown children, and the joke at my house is that, um, and apologies to Sharon, that Facebook is for the olds. Um, that you know, Snapchat and and um, and Instagram are, are where it's at. But I, I I do think that the um, the smarter campaigns are realizing that you can interact with folks through different media. Um, let's talk about this notion of, of of different folks. I mean, one of the things that comes up when you're talking about social media is this notion of the digital divide. Um, you know, there are segments of the population, um, socioeconomic, racial, what have you, who have different access to and use of uh, online technology and, and sites like social media. How, if at all, 
does that factor into the work that you do and do you find um, that you have to adjust or make special effort to reach certain communities? Allie? Um, being mobile friendly. Uh, that is such a huge thing. Um, populations that Minority populations, uh, households with lower incomes, they're using their mobile devices to look on social media more than other uh, demographics are. So making sure that if you are bringing them to your site, is your site mobile friendly? Is the form you want them to fill out, is that mobile friendly? It's not just that they're on social media and that platform is usually mobile friendly, your Facebook app, your Twitter app. It's also where you're bringing them. Is that also mobile friendly? Also, how much text are you putting on that page? If there's a lot of text or if you have an infograph and that infograph is filled with things that they have to zoom in on their phone, well, that's, that's not helping those demographics. So I think that's a really easy way to make social media more uh, universal for our users. I agree with Allie, and that's uh, something that we face uniquely. About a third of our students are students of color and come from underrepresented communities, and so this is a real issue for us. And the way that we address it is really through that uh, mobile technology. You see a high saturation uh, for mobile technology across all uh, groups, and so you don't see that digital divide when it comes to the mobile technology, uh, and so that really is our focus. And so with that, we are really leveraging that uh, in terms of text messaging, but then also the mobile websites is a key piece there. But then I can't emphasize enough about how you're integrating that offline and that online work then too. And so trying to capture information but then send them to uh, in-person activities I think is the best way to really create true engagement then too. Because I think you're limited, you know, obviously in sometimes 140 characters, it's hard to have real engagement through that. And so how do you bring folks together, particularly of diverse viewpoints, to really have a conversation, uh, I think is really the most impactful way to really sort of strengthen our democracy. I would only add, I agree with everything that's been said, particularly about mobile friendliness. I would only add that in our office, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, we have been attuned to making sure it's in a language that people are comfortable with. Uh, and, you know, all American citizens, of course, uh, everyone who's eligible to vote is an American citizen and has to demonstrate, in most cases, some English proficiency. But uh, everyone that I know of is more comfortable with technical instructions in their native language, even if they know English. I know this, my mother was from Austria, and I know she spoke beautiful, fluent, almost accent-free English. She did not sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I can tell you that her fellow <laughs> countrymen at all. Uh, and yet, I know from her experience growing up with her that whether it was instructions to the refrigerator or a government document, she was much more comfortable with things, technical instructions in her native language. So we're very sensitive to that, though people that had demonstrated a capacity to speak English, making sure it's in language, literally in language that they can understand. And, and I will point out, uh, you know, taking off my uh, Humphrey hat and putting on my election geek hat, I have worked with Pew's Voting Information Project, and one of the things we've benefited from um, is the work here in Minnesota and elsewhere actually translating election information into different languages, including some like Karen that I'd never heard of, um, and making them um, available to voters. So in some ways, social media has become um, the force multiplier. Um, uh, Steve, this is uh, mostly for you, but um, but but Mike and Allie, feel free to um, chip in. Speaking of the work on the Voting Information Project, and I see um, at least one and maybe some other local election officials here, one of the things that we picked up in 2016 um, um, especially from the work that Facebook did, is that this tsunami of interest, whether it be political or what have you, I mean, you know, the 70,000 folks you saw on your voter registration page, um, the uh, rush that we saw to early voting as a result of a similar push in many states, um, to what extent were those numbers a surprise to you, and have you had to kind of widen the pipes and expand capacity in anticipation of this sort of, um, this online tsunami of interest in elections? That's a great question. Um, I'll tell you, uh, fortunately we have not had to widen the pipes in this sense, and we always have to keep, uh, keep up with that stuff. But I would say 70,000 is a pretty good test of our system. And we, there were other states I won't name because I don't want to embarrass them, that when Facebook did what it did, what it did they crashed. We did not, which is good. But you know, we have to keep on top of that. That's why I say, um, resources, it takes time, but no, um, it was a good stress test for us, getting 70,000 in one day, that did surprise me, I did not expect to get nearly 70,000 in one day, but we came through, our system came through 
um, to find public switches go. And I think there's a benefit to that. I mean, that's actually taking less pressure off same day registration then too. And so a lot of pressure gets put on our local election officials to have to process all those applications. And so when it's able to come in ahead of time, it's a way for I think local election officials to save some money, but then also to make that same day process go much smoother for a lot of folks. So I think in the end, it's a, it's a real huge positive on multiple angles. All right, well, I, 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 let me ask one more question, and this one's a little juicier, and I'm going to go through these questions in my lap. So I'm going to encourage you all to be um, to speak in paragraphs and not in um, sound bites. Um, let me go ahead and address um, what I jokingly call the 800-pound bear in the room. Um, obviously, the good thing about social media is that it makes it easier for pretty much anyone to have their say and potentially have an impact on the American electoral process. How do we balance that with the need to make sure that, the, that, that voters and candidates and others are not subjected to the kind of apparently nefarious activity um, that we saw in 2016, which to be fair, didn't just happen on Facebook. You know, there are, there are people who wish us ill and, and would like nothing better than to see our voting process be even more chaotic than it was designed to be. Um, how do we balance the need to make sure that everyone gets their say and essentially lock the doors to make sure that folks who don't belong get in? Well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll hang up and take your answer. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll be quick. I don't want to monopolize you, but I think it, it truly is a balance. We were discussing before this um, uh, offline here the fact that in some senses this is nothing new. This goes back to the town crier in the 1700s. Were there people, pamphleteers or others in the bygone era, who were doing much the same thing, impersonating people or propagating ideas that they didn't really believe in or trying to sway people? Probably. Um, on the other hand, what's the remedy? Uh, my first and initial reaction is the remedy's got to be sort of within these companies and platforms. I don't know what role, if any, there is on First Amendment grounds for the government to come in and require something. I don't know that the government can pass a bill mandating that Facebook do some sort of, or anyone, a detailed background check. I don't know what Facebook can do or anyone um, to uh, to sort of cleanse and screen. Is it that if you want to open up a Facebook account, you've got to go through some rigorous background check, provide social security information? I don't know. I think that would have a chilling effect. It's a fancy way of saying I'm not. I'm not sure. I think a lot of people have to do a lot of thinking about that, but it is a balance, of course. So I think it's important to remember that while Facebook isn't responsible for the attacks, they do have a responsibility to address this. And I think our big concern right now is around the algorithms that exist. And so back in kind of how Facebook works is what's showing up in your feed, a computer is sort of processing that. Uh, and it rewards certain type of activity. And what we've seen is foreign entities have now figured out how to uh, really kind of benefit from that. By using just a $100,000 investment, they were able to reach a significant number of people. And I think it really requires Facebook to investigate kind of how their algorithms are set up. And that's also a real threat, to, I think, to our democracy. So I run a nonprofit. We try to reach as many of our students on Facebook because we know where they're at. But really, in order for us to reach them, we can't just get them to like our organization. We actually have to pay Facebook to promote our organization. Uh, I can't tell you, Ali probably knows this too, is I get weekly notifications from Facebook saying, hey, if you really want to reach all your followers, pay us X amount of money and we'll help you reach them. And I think the one of the challenges that we're facing is Facebook is a for-profit corporation. Their job is to make money and these algorithms are built in a way to help them maximize those profits. And so I think they really have to look at that and realize that the impact that that's having on our democracy and figure out ways to really change that to benefit uh, the entire group. And we saw the mission statement that Sharon said, is that really, is their mission statement meeting what's going on right now? And I guess I'm concerned about that. Uh, yeah, so the kind of the locked door, as you said at the end, do we lock the door? Um, I think there's kind of the proactive, which would be locking the door, doing background checks, or do you become reactive and do you search for these pages that are out there and try to shut them down once they're made? That's I think kind of the question people are grappling with of, well, do we do more on the front end and we stop them from ever getting made, or do we find a way to be more reactive to find them faster and get them down faster? I am going to agree. I'm not really sure what the best answer is there. I think there is a chilling effect if you kind of do the first and 
tell people that they need to submit all this information before they can open a Facebook page. Uh, and then also with uh, um, algorithms and things, it does it does create issues for nonprofits or smaller organizations to kind of get our word out. Um, however, it is kind of built too for the viewer. If you're looking at a page, you want to see what your friends are up to, and um, Facebook kind of recognizes that. But if something's getting a lot of shares, well, then that's bumping up, and it's going to keep going to more and more people. And if it's getting likes, more and more people are going to see it. And if it's getting comments, more people are going to see it. And then that's when you get those clickbait articles on your Facebook feed from the two friends replaced that liked some page and now it's on yours kind of situation happening. Um, and those are kind of the ones that I don't know the answer to that, but um, I think that is something Facebook will have to look at. And not just Facebook, I think Twitter and Instagram. And I don't see this becoming less of a problem um, going forward. I see it becoming more of a problem. And to a point, you can kind of say, like, the issue tabs that um, Sharon was talking about, that's great. Being able to kind of inform yourself and become informed is great. But um, not everyone is going to be proactive and do that. So how do you help just the person that's scrolling through Facebook for five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the evening? How do you stop them from seeing that crazy article? I don't have the answer to that question, but if you do, you should find me and tell me. <laughs> well, actually, that's a, that's a nice segue um, um, from our, um, at least judging from the cards, um, very smart and judging from what I could see, our very good looking audience. Um, so uh, thinking about, we, we've talked a little bit about threats from the outside. Um, let's come inside to, let, let's get out of the realm of cyber war and get back into the much more familiar world of um, dirty tricks and disinformation. Um, bunch of questions about fake news um, and voter suppression, everything from um, literally fake news, whether it was the ballot box in a truck in Ohio, which even the Ohio Secretary of State um, denounced, or the good old dirty trick stuff like um, one party votes on Tuesday, the other party votes on Wednesday, or um, citizenship documents will be checked at the poll. Uh, obviously, we're not going to solve these problems, but talk to me from each of your perspectives about how do we deal with the greater role that social media plays in sharing this kind of dirty trick and disinformation, and how are you all working if at all, to counteract it in your day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month work? So I can answer the second question probably the best. And I think that's a focus of ours, and that really is about critical thinking skills. And so I think we've seen, unfortunately, an evolution over the last few decades of really these type of skills not being uh, really developed in our high schools. And so at the community college level, it's something that we're really pushing more of. How do we help our students really develop those skills to understand what potentially is fake news and what's not? And how do you really get to the source of this information? And I think really that investment in our higher ed institutions is critical to provide that role. And again, as another part of that is I think we've seen civics really leave uh, K-12, and there's been less and less uh, information to really encourage students to participate in the process uh, because it's seen as dirty. And so how do we bring that back uh, to not only the K-12 level, but to our community and technical colleges specifically as a way to help students prepare and be active citizens uh, in this state, in this world? Yeah, um, I would agree with that. Uh I would also kind of add in that putting out the right information. Um, it, social media is filled with information. It's overwhelming a lot of times. Um, but the more we can put out the right information and trying to push that into the world, it, it does help. Um, also, from a personal standpoint, don't interact with the bad information. That helps it. Um, you commenting, you dis I mean, that's, that's helping it move forward. So. Um, not interacting with that, also trying to find places that kind of um, write down the lists of, I know this happens sometimes um, during the election of, this is false information that gets put out. Some good journalists will kind of do that piece and sharing those kind of articles so that people understand that, uh, they understand that misinformation is out there and talking about that instead of promoting or kind of highlighting the misinformation itself. people straight. And in our world, when 
it comes to elections administration, it could be as simple as it might not even be nefarious. It could just be wrong information um, that someone just uh, not meaning to do any harm spreads about voter registration deadlines, for example. That's one that comes up. Uh, we have same day voter registration, and so when some people think that maybe there's a cutoff, um, and so we try to uh, spread that information through multiple means. Obviously, social media and electronically, but we have a decentralized uh, voter administration uh, system in the state. We have some uh, voter uh, uh, voting. Uh, elections administrators here in the audience today from counties outside the metro area. And so we have a network of people throughout the state, at the county, city, even township level that can help us get information about uh, what the true facts are, what the true dates, deadlines, and requirements are. So, so far, that's worked. So this this next question, I, this is a really good question, um, I, and it, it reminds me a little bit. I remember um, hearing um, Senator Wellstone talk about um, some days he felt like he spent more time stopping the bad than pushing the good. Um, but a uh, question here about um, to the extent that people do want to engage with their representatives online, um, is there any, do you see any role for a positive interaction or is it a little bit like the Yelp factor that, that usually the people who take the time to comment tend to dislike it more? Is there a role for plaudits and dialogue as opposed to complaints and attacks online? So I would say the answer is yes. And I think what we've seen uh, throughout the history of this country is really civic organizations playing a role in helping to structure that and organize that. And so I think that's the, the critical step here is how do organizations like the one I work for, the one Allie works for, really play a role of engaging citizens in that conversation. And I know both of our organizations do that on a regular basis in trying to help folks understand that by reaching out to your representative, offering your viewpoint, uh, that that can be beneficial, that can be, uh, you know, they, they do listen to that. In creating a culture where that's understood and that that's valued, I think is that critical step. And too often we hear about the negative examples, uh, the yelling that goes on at, at various meetings, and it's trying to move on beyond that and really create dialogue. Uh, and that's something we're focused on. And we're gathering about 80 students this weekend, and we're gonna have a civic dialogue conversation about uh, job security issues. And so how do we make sure we're teaching these skills uh, early on in our high schools and colleges? And I think that's the other way we can really combat this um, yeah definitely I mean there's definitely room for positive uh, energy uh, but I think um, kind of going off of that it's how to be strategic about it how to make sure it's getting out there um, louder than the negative energy or the negative comments and things that are out there as well um, I don't know if I have too much more to add than other than it, it can happen. I guess, is it directly towards like politicians? Is that what you're saying? Is it direct? Yeah, I did, the context of the question is things like town hall and other okay. um, one to many, many to one conversations. Does it become an opportunity for discussion or does it look like some of the town halls in person that we've seen where the loudest voices tend to be the most negative and either drown out or discourage others? Yeah. Um, so if, you, if you could fix that for us. Yeah, I'm in on the next it. 30 seconds, gonna, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> That'll be what I'll be up to. No, I, I definitely think that's um, possible. And I think if it, you are passionate about making sure that happens, um, stories work very well. Images work very well. Um, that's, that's great ways to kind of bring to light something in a way that um, sticks with people. So that would kind of be my way of if you're looking for a way to make sure that that's not just getting pushed to the side and all that's happening is the negative, turn what you want to say into a story or turn it into an image or turn it into a video. Um, that's more personal and that's going to stick with people on social media better. Uh, I'll be quick. I'm an optimist on this question. Notwithstanding some of the scenes we see uh, about you know, horrific off-the-rails town hall meetings uh, that happened from time to time now, several years ago, in the summer of 2009, um, uh, federally, I just think it's kind of like, you know, those, those are what get covered. I understand why they get covered, but I think most of those interactions are not like that. And I don't think they'll necessarily, I think they will continue to be mostly not like that. And I've got one more question, uh, sort of cluster, and these are really all for you, Steve. So I'm going to sort of mush them together and then add a little spice of my own. Um, a question about cybersecurity, question about um, discretion in making voter rolls available, 
um, and um, uh, sort of the, 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 the state's role, not just in running elections, but in um, encouraging participation. Um, how do you see all of that? And I guess also in the context of um, the Klobuchar Amendment, um, which I understand is getting some resistance on Capitol Hill because of concerns about um, uh, an overbroad federal role. Um, uh, you know, if you can, in you know, brevity being the very soul of wit, talk a little bit about the state's role and how you see states and the federal government cooperating on um, election administration and participation issues. Similarly, on a technical level, we're going to want to know whether the federal government knows or suspects um, that there's a plan in place to physically disrupt infrastructure or spread viruses or interfere with or, uh, or get into uh, databases. We want to know that stuff. And I think everyone acknowledges, no matter what side they were on in the election, that that's something we have to do a better job of that. And I think secretaries of state across the country agree. So that relationship with the Department of Homeland Security is one already getting stronger and looking forward to it getting even stronger. Um, I think it has to be a more collaborative effort. And I have to say, as I said in my, my remarks, I view cybersecurity as the real challenge when it comes to the integrity of our elections. We have to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. It's hard to do. The bad guys are smart. The bad guys are sometimes well-funded. They are innovative. They are clever. And staying ahead of them is going to take a lot of time, not just my time, a lot of other people's time is going to take effort and energy and attention and money. And uh, so that's the one thing that I just want to emphasize here. It is a big threat. We really did well in 2016 in Minnesota, but we can't just sort of count on that going forward. Yes, we dodged all those bills in 2016. I think we did the right things in our office and elsewhere to avoid the bad results that you saw in other states, but it took a lot of focus and attention and time and money. And now we got to do it all over again, consistently, constantly, really, to avoid that. Thank you, Steve. Um, and then just a, in, in the spirit of last word, um, Ali, Mike, any kind of closing thoughts, things that's occurred to you for today, um, something that you didn't get to mention that you'd like to mention? As I, I have an old boss who used to conclude every meeting with anything else for the good of the order? So, so I think just the last thing is, I mean, if we really want to engage young people, we want to engage more people in voting. Uh, the, you know, what I'm concerned about, and I applaud Steve for his work to get three million Minnesotans out to vote this last election, but I'm concerned about the million that didn't show up. And so why did they not show up? And I think what we need is a paradigm shift really within government and to think government as more of a platform than really just providing services and being transactional. And I think some of the ways that we can do that is really by kind of opening government up a little bit. And obviously, Steve has major concerns when it comes to cybersecurity, but there's a lot we can do with technology to make this process easier. Uh, one of those for me is just looking at the way our application process works. Uh, so if you look at a, a, a voter registration application, one, why do we have voter registration? Uh, there are many states that are moving to automatic voter registration that would save this state you know, millions and millions of dollars in those applications, and we can move to that pretty quickly. Uh, and I think that would benefit students immensely. Uh, why do we go through that sort of loop uh, or that hoop as part of it? And then the second thing is just the form itself. I think a lot could be done to simplify the form. And how do we bring things like design thinking into government? Uh, and so there's, you know, we all have an iPhone, or many of us have iPhones. Facebook uses design thinking as a way to uh, structure its sites. We don't always bring that into government. And so is the form that we're using really the best way uh, to really help minimize problems? And after the 2008-2010 election, absentee ballots went through a whole design thinking process to really improve them in the state of Minnesota. I think there are other parts of our election process that should go through that similar process that would then help us really improve it overall and increased participation. And, and, and um, you didn't know this, but I'm going to thank you for that. I would just like to point out that here at Humphrey, um, the Certificate for Election Administration includes um, the nation's first and still only course on election design taught by design 
um, superstars, Dana Chisnell and Whitney Quisenberry. If you are interested um, in learning more about or, hint, hint, taking that class, um, we'd love to hear from you. But, um, Allie, you get the last word. Lucky me. Uh, I think you covered elections very well. I'm going to push it, kind of loop it back over into social media a little bit. Um, I do think that social media is going to play a larger and larger role in elections moving forward. I don't think that's going to change. Um, and Facebook was really big this year, but uh, as we've seen, especially with the younger generations, Gen Z is kind of the new and upcoming they're leaving Facebook and they're not even there anymore. So I think that the conversation is going to only broaden. Um, so I don't think that stopping the conversation at just Facebook or just Twitter is smart either. I think we need to look towards Instagram and we need to start looking towards Snapchat. And I mean, YouTube is huge, which is kind of a different thing to even look into, but that's a really large platform that um, younger generations are using. So how do we use these as tools? Because that's what they are, they're tools. Face-to-face um, -face interaction does not become less important because Facebook is important. Uh, neither does other things that we've done in the past. So how do we use it as a tool to create and kind of affect the right direction um, for kind of voter engagement in the future? Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um.